If we think about Zipcar and its success, I co-founded it 14 years ago, and today there's about a million people using 12,000 cars parked across North America, 300 university towns, and in the UK. I could tell the story lots of different ways, but the way that I'm kind of shaping it and framing it today is I think there's three reasons why we had some success. And the first was that we built this company on the back of excess capacity, which you might not have realized. If you think about the way that we purchase cars today, with the exception of Moto and, and Zipcar, um, you have to buy an entire car, which is about $9,000 a year on average. People don't believe that, that number, but that's really the number from the US Household Survey. And even though you're spending $9,000 a year, you actually only use that car 5% of the time. So that is an incredibly inefficient way to buy this asset when 95% of the time you're not even using it. The second way that people could buy it was they would do car rental, which comes in these 24-hour bundles, even though you want it for two hours or 26 hours. So again, there was this fundamental economic mismatch of excess capacity that would lead us renting by the hour and by the day, paying only as you use it, we could take advantage of that fundamental economic excess capacity. The second thing is that we built a platform for participation. So again, if you think about renting a car for an hour, if you're gonna do it the old fashioned way, it takes, you would never do it because you had to have something that was really simple and direct. It has to take you know, 30 seconds to make this rental and we have to work with you. So we had to build this beautiful piece of technology so that it was really simple for you as an individual to self-serve and to be part of this. And this platform for participation is fundamental to how you interact with the company and how you get access to the services. And the last piece is that we treated our customers as collaborators. I always called my customers members. And again, if you think, go back to the car rental model and how Zipcar really disrupted and, and was an example of a new way of interacting. This is back in 2000. And in the car rental model, which you guys all know, you're the customer on the other side of the counter. Me, car rental company, I know you're gonna screw with my car and I know you're, you're gonna return it in some terrible way. And you customer know that I, car rental company, am trying to screw you, that I quote one price, you get another price. It's really this horrible thing. And we're kind of oppositional. With the Zipcar, we said, you know what? There is no counter. You're on our side of the counter. You're with us. You are our co-creators and co-collaborators. We asked our customers to do all sorts of things that used to be done by the company. So we want you alone to go do a walk around the car. We want you to use our fuel card and fill up the car when it's at a quarter tank. We want you to feel that this car is your car, and we've named the cars, and we've, you are our co-creator. You really are part of us making this company. And today, 15 years later, 14 years later, that idea of us not being passive consumers has really kind of taken root, and we see it blossoming in lots of places. And there's this cartoon I found that I loved. So here's Moses coming down out of the mountain with the two tablets, and of course, we today would say, you know, is there a section at the bottom for comments? <laughs> there's no way we're letting God tell us what to do. You know, we're, we're participants, we're co-creators. And that really feels kind of like the zeitgeist of the moment. And I think of this word as consumers as so, 1950s, do you feel like a consumer? Do you feel like you're, it's like, that's not who we are anymore. So if we put these things together, um, I'm calling this new organizational structure Peers Incorporated. It's peers and platforms working together that we bring, we turn excess capacity into abundance. And we're seeing it in sector after sector after sector, and I think it's fundamental to the future. So if you look at this, these companies, you know, eBay, Linux, Facebook, YouTube, Skype, all of these are peers incorporated companies. All of these are relying on using excess capacity and us as really co-creators. They don't work without us. And I guess one of my favorite pull, things to pull out of this is if you think of Skype, they built a telecommunications company. Think how expensive and painful and hard that would normally be, but they built it on the back of my laptop, my data connection, and my video camera that already was there. They didn't have to build this giant thing, they use this excess capacity, and in very short order, they became a really gigantic and big telecommunications company. So we are participants using this stuff. And an example I really love, all of my work has to do with sharing, and if you think of the word excess capacity, it is fundamentally about sharing, because excess capacity is saying someone else or something else has control of this asset, and we're going to start using it. So my favorite example of sharing is actually bed sharing. So get into your mind bed sharing. Have you guys shared any beds lately? 
And the kind of bed sharing I'm talking about, and you will quickly be able to go there, is when I travel a lot, I do stay at friends' houses. It's way more fun, and I know them. And I might be lucky enough to stay in a spare bedroom that was their home office, and it could be pretty pleasant. And if I'm really lucky, I get a double bed, yes. And um, if I'm unlucky, they booted the teenager. And um, I'm staying in those slimy sheets in that crummy place, which is, in fact, why we have hotels, because we don't really want to stay in those kind of places. We might have friends. And so hotels are fundamentally bed sharing. And remember that next time you're lying on that bed, on that pillow. So I went and did some research into what are the largest bed sharing companies in the world. And the Intercontinental Hotels Group has been around for 65 years. And in those 65 years, they built 645,000 rooms, bed capacity in 100 countries. And the second largest one, the Hilton Hotels, has been at it for 90, 95 years. I mean, it's been this huge, giant effort to be able to build something of that size and scale. And you guys know what I'm going to be saying next, is that Airbnb, in its fourth year, had the same size offering as the largest hotel chain in the world. And this is where I do my, can you believe it? This is so disruptive, the world has changed. It has changed forever that we can do something like this in four years and produce this kind of thing. It is phenomenal. And the old guard and legacy companies should be terrified. And couch surfing, in its ninth year, had two and a half million rooms which is really incredible. So couch surfing isn't exactly parallel because no money changes hands, but how amazing. So if we think about the old industrial economy, why did we create companies? Why did we create governments? Like, what was the point? The point was to do things that we as individuals couldn't do. So what are companies particularly good at? They're good at things that require lots of money. Millions of dollars every year, I, Robin Chase, no way do I, can I do any of those kinds of big investments over many years. Companies do things that if you have many, many kinds of expertise that all need to be integrated together and made simple, that's a company. I, Robin, am only good at two things. I'm not good at 20 things making it simple. If you need things that have to be standards or have consistency in standards, I, Robin, can't make you have to wear leggings when you give talks on stage. Like, you're, you're, not gonna believe, you're not gonna follow that. But if I'm a company and I have, or a government, I have some kind of clout, you'll use my standards. Typically, this is all kind of bound together in a kind of global brand. On the other hand, individuals do things that they are uniquely, they're much, much better at, that companies could do them. They were painful and annoying and expensive. And what is that? That is things that are local, things that are customized and specialized. If you think again of the industrial economy, the whole point was to make things kind of standardized and get these economies of scale because you hated dealing with little tiny parts. And companies used to do it, but they hated it. And the internet made us able to take back those roles that we used to do, this very local, fine-grained stuff, talking, getting into my social networks and my friends. I am happy to talk to my friends about things because that's what I do, and companies are trying to get into that action. So that's what people are best at as individuals. So we put these things together. They're very, very complementary. And it's this relationship that I'm calling Peers Incorporated, this new kind of organizational structure that's a collaboration. The industrial side, these companies, they provide a platform for participation. And the peers deliver a kind of diversity of offering. And to simplify this, I think of it as a kind of yin and yang, that it's a complementary and symbiotic relationship, and each side is willing, willing to participate with the other side, and if one side is too greedy, the other guys won't participate, either way, that you have to, it's, it's really together. And then it's all kind of swimming in this sea of excess capacity. So let me talk about this, what the incorporated side does. They, when you have a platform for participation, by its platformness, it delivers the ability to have high growth in economies of scale, because that's what a platform is meant to do. So if you get the platform right, very hard to do, it can do these amazing things. Duolingo, my new favorite, um, Duolingo is a language instruction online language instruction firm that on the back side, the excess capacity, translates CNN and BuzzFeed for a fee, so you learn languages for free, and while you're doing that, you translate. And they're about uh, 22 months old, and look at their growth. So let's talk about the peers part. Peers deliver diversity, and it is just incredible, the power of diversity, and I am a deep believer in the power of diversity. When you have diversity, it delivers necessarily innovation, because you've got lots of different ways and people iterating on these platforms, and we do things differently. It also delivers an amazing resilience and redundancy. 
nothing is too big to fail. And there's this nice distributed network, and we can have a very solid system. An example here, one of my favorites, is if you think of your smartphone and apps. The smartphone is the platform for participation. It was built in this nice industrialized model way. And all of those apps on top are these local peer efforts. And in the five years that the smartphones have existed, we've had more than two million tries, two million ways of doing apps. Just think, I think it's the most phenomenal pace of innovation, I think, ever known to man, to have two million different things going on top of these. And we know there's some dumb things. Who cares? Because it was the excess capacity. Not each one of those apps merited $600. They definitely didn't. But because it's $600 that had already been paid for, this was idle time. You can have really stupid apps and really phenomenally clever, amazing apps that we look at and think, who would have thought? Like, how incredibly smart that is. And it's this peers on the platform. And this kind of diversity of offering givers and it gives an incredibly customized service. So there's a nice story of a person who was sharing a car, getting the keys to go to an island called Ile de Ré off the coast of France. And when they went to pick it up, the owner said, oh, Ile de Ré, I love Ile de Ré. You know, if you drive on this side, the cliff side, and it's really spectacular views, this side is the really beautiful beaches. This is my favorite beach, and this is the best fish restaurant. You're not going to get that from Zipcar or Hertz, right? You're going to have to get it from a person who is local. So the reason I'm totally infatuated with this business model is it has these characteristics that are, I feel like it's the right organizational structure for our times. Things are moving really, really quickly. When we have this kind of business model, we're able to experiment, adapt, and iterate in a very fast pace. And the thing that is driving change most of all is climate. And this report here was produced by the World Bank, a very conservative financial institution. And what in heck does, you know, four degrees turn down the heat? It's, uh, this report's a year and a half old. And so four degrees is, by 2100, the likelihood is we'll reach four degrees centigrade global average climate change. Do you guys work in, in uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit? Centigrade. So, so if you're like me, you say, okay, what does four degrees global climate change mean? Like, I don't know what four degrees means. So I did some more research. And then to put it into context, when we were last at minus four degrees, North America, and particularly where I live in Boston, and I don't know here, was under several kilometers of ice in the last ice age. So the difference between minus four degrees and today is several kilometers of ice to now, and that happened over 35,000 years. And so the, the difference between minus four degrees and today, many kilometers of up to where we are now, and we are going forward that same four degrees in less than 100 years. So playing that forward to make it this story even worse. When I was doing this research, we talk about global average climate change and the four degrees. Obviously, when you think about it, that's global, which means over land, it's going to be a lot hotter, which had never occurred to me. So over North America, which is where we are right now, it's supposed to be plus 11 degrees Fahrenheit, 6 degrees centigrade higher. No humans have ever, ever existed at plus 6 degrees. And actually, the last time it was plus 4 degrees was 20 million years ago. There weren't any humans, and there was a lot of the species that we have today that didn't exist. This is not 85 years. And by 2060s, if we continue with business as usual, because the other number is if every country does what it said it was going to do. So when people talk about, oh, yeah, yeah, worry about climate change, it's great for your children, I'm thinking, are you planning to live 15 more years? If it's going to be this by 2060, by 2040, it is going to be incredibly unpleasant. So for me, every waking moment, I'm on the path of figuring out how to make this change faster. For me personally, yeah, I love my children, but for me personally, it really matters. The um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change just released a report. They do them every like, two to four years. And the most different one had a really nice metaphor that the person said. The difference between plus two degrees, which is where the scientists are saying we're trying to hold it to plus two degrees, and plus seven is the difference between driving on an AC road at 30 miles an hour versus 90 miles an hour. It's risky at 30. Two degrees is not good. It's risky. But at 90, it's deadly. And this is, this is the consensus of 3,000 scientists. And they're saying words like, it's deadly. And I feel like we have all these little nice words that we're using. Like, there was this, this line from them that, yeah, by 2100, plus 4 degrees centigrade, 
It's incompatible with civilization. So, yeah. So just internalize what does incompatible with civilization actually mean in reality. And I feel like we're all walking around in this sleepwalking dream of, yeah, it's business as usual. It is not business as usual. We've really got to get on this. So while you're deeply depressed, my friend Benny Banerjee at Stanford had this really nice sentence. And he said, you can't solve exponential problems with linear solutions. It's a really great sentence. And we are right now in full-on exponential problems. And the reason I've been talking about Peers Incorporated is because this, for me, is really the only way that we can go forward. I just want to give you a little bit of um, hope here. Uh, wait quickly while you're depressed, the three things that you've got to be doing. One, role model in your daily life that this is an issue for you and you personally are taking action to reduce CO2 in your own personal life. Two, leadership in your business life, which is what I'm in fact doing, as you see. And three, political action. We've really got to get on this and you should be doing these three things all the time. The sharing economy, which is part of what we're talking about here today, it's a subset for me of this giant peers incorporated paradigm and why it's fabulous. It's incredibly resource efficient for these hard asset resources that we're really taking advantage of getting the most out of each hard asset resource. It's highly scalable. I showed you all those growth curves. It's remarkable. The, the front edge of this transition, it, for me, it is the front edge of the transition to a new economy. We cannot keep building on our old economic model, which is all about growth and throwing things into landfills that we absolutely fundamentally have to change, and this sharing economy and the peers and corporate is that path forward. And the value of community, um, I have this new sentence that in times of calamity, which we all are coming, going to be seeing in our future, every one of us, if you think about Sandy or Katrina, when you have this calamity, who is there? We are there, the people left are there, and we have, to have this, we have to start exercising our community muscle now so that when these bad things happen, we have a community muscle reflex and community muscle memory that we know and have a community to turn to very deeply and closely, because that's what we're all gonna need to survive. So, some very short things, positive things to end. So, Peers Incorporated can change the laws of physics. If in 2000 I had said to you, I want to build the largest hotel in the world, and I'm going to beat out the Intercontinental Hotel Group, and I'm going to build it in like four years, you all, every one of us, would profoundly have said, that is physically impossible. It takes a certain amount of time to move this physical stuff. And we would have all just truly believed that. And then if you look at here, this is business as usual, building hotels, the path of building hotels over the first four years. And this is the peers incorporated model of Airbnb excess capacity. So when you're using excess capacity, stuff that already exists, you can move it around at a really fast pace when you're taking the speed of the crowds. And so when we think of the size and scale of what has to be done, we can do it in time if we start doing it the right way. So for me, peers incorporated is honestly what is giving me hope for the future. And so my challenge for you guys is one, go find some excess capacity and start exploiting it. Um, two, build your community muscle. Don't forget to put that in your daily life. And three, if you've got a fabulous idea, make sure to focus and put it into platforms for participation because we need to scale. Things are moving really fast and we are creating that future. And so let's create the future that we want to see. Um, when Zipcar was just three years old, we got an email to info at zipcar.com, so into the big slush bucket email. And it was apropos of nothing, nothing in particular had happened, and here is that slide in its entirety, minus the thing name, is have I told you lately that I love you? So when we think about this future, I don't want you guys to feel terrified and scared. We can build companies and we can design worlds in which we get love letters because it's a better life. It's a better way of doing things. And you know, I just want you to think about when was the last time you told um, Comcast or your bank sent them unsolicited love notes? I mean, why are, we, why are we not feeling that way about everything we interact with?